William Moulton Marston, a psychologist already famous for inventing the polygraph, struck upon the idea for a new superhero, one who would triumph not with fists or firepower, but with love. Fine, said his wife, but make her a woman. That was all it took, and in 1941 the world was introduced to Diana, Princess of Themyscira, better known as Wonder Woman. A founding member of the Justice League and one of the big three of DC Comics, the Wonder Woman title has been published by DC Comics continuously with only a brief hiatus in 1986. Her presence has been felt on TV with every animated incarnation of the Justice League, a live-action TV show in the 70s starring Linda Carter, and of course a blockbuster movie in 2017, the most successful movie of the DCEU to date. Hi everyone, I'm Mac, and this is LEGO DC Superhero Set 76075, Wonder Woman Warrior Battle. Who is this young woman? She's my, um, and, um, Diana, Princess of the Mist Prince, Diana Prince. If you believe that this war should stop, help me stop it right now. You will soon find out. cannot wait for Wonder Woman 84 to come out. Oh, thank you for joining me today, everyone, and thank you especially for indulging me on that intro. I have always been a fan of Wonder Woman, even before the rise of the DCEU. I collected her comic every month when I did collect comics. The one title they dedicated to her, which I always felt was a disservice. I mean, being one of the big three of the DC Comics universe, the big three being herself, Batman, and Superman, she was the only one that did not have multiple titles. Also, she has been sorely missing from the movies for decades now. So when the movie released last year, it was the only DC movie I've gone to see on opening weekend. I was so relieved it was good. Now what we have here is the only set that was licensed for that movie. Let me say that again. The only set. Aquaman hasn't even hit theaters yet and there's already two out for him. However, if we were only going to get one set, I'm excited that it was this set. There is so much goodness going on here, so let's get to it. Now let's take a look at the villain of the set to start off. Now normally I would hold off on the figures until the end, but in this case, Ares is not a minifig. Instead, he is a brick-built giant fig. To anyone that has seen the movie, this is obviously not the look of Ares from that. But I'm okay with that. This has a much more comic book feel to it. He's large, and he's menacing, and I love the bone helmet, and this just says God of War to, the, to me more than the representation on the big screen. Being a brick-built giant fig, Ares has all of the same articulation as a minifig. His legs pivot back and forth at the hips, his arms pivot at the shoulders, although he has a ball joint allowing more articulation in the shoulders in this incarnation, and he has a neck pivot just like the minifigs. The helmet has some movement in it as well, with the horns and jaw pieces being hinged, allowing for you to customize his look a bit to something you would like. Unfortunately though, the helmet does not come off. It's built onto his head. A large part of me does wish that I could take this off just to show a all-gloss black head underneath. On his helmet are decals for the eye sockets and nostrils. Likewise, the prints on his torso are decals and not printed pieces. I've never been good at lining up multiple decals like this, so I would have preferred to have printed pieces, but the stickers do look good despite my inability to align them correctly. But here, his head. This right here is a printed piece, and it is just wonderful. 
The face of Ares on this half round cylinder is beautiful with the red eyes and the highlights. I like the placement of these prints in relation to the helmet when it is in its default position, giving the impression of highlights and shadows across his face. Like his face is cast in shadow and that's why you can't see it. I like this design very much for this character. The hands of Ares are two Technic pieces that allow him to hold his sword and shield through the use of pegs. His hands, such as they are, don't grasp things. Instead, they are built onto him. This large sword of his, for example, slips through the open hole of what would be his fingers, and it does a very passable job of holding it. In fact, it's not until you take a closer look at the model that you realize he's not actually holding it. The sword piece, of course, we've seen before in LEGO Ninjago sets, usually in gold. I think this is the first time we've seen it in gray. The blade of the sword itself is constructed into a Technic-built hilt, and the whole thing looks really good for him. His shield, on the other hand, is a bit disappointing. They use a standard gray dish piece, with just another Technic build on the back side for the peg to fit into Ares' hand. However, it's just a gray dish. No printing. Not even any type of sticker to put over it to give it some texture or some design. That is a little disappointing to me, and it might be something I try to correct later on down the line with some customizing. And next up we have the plane that Steve flew. If you remember, this is the aircraft he was piloting when he splashed down off the shore of Themyscira. And this model, what can I say, is a wonderful representation of its on-screen counterpart. The shape, the design, the wings, even the wingspan itself seems to be in scale with that actual plane. For armaments, the plane has two stud shooters just behind the propeller. On the real-life plane, this is where the machine guns would be mounted, so I very much like the stud shooters being placed here. Under the wings, we have a set of Flick missile launchers. Now, a plane at this time in history had nothing like missile launchers, and I don't think a plane of this size would have even had mounted bomb racks. Instead, the pilot would drop them out the side of the plane by hand. I understand LEGO mounting these on the wings of the plane, however, it gives the model play value for kids, but for me, I'm going to be taking them off after this review to go for a more historically accurate look. And while we're talking about historical accuracy, there is one issue I would like to address. The star. The inclusion of the American star on the wings and tail of the plane does not surprise me in the least, but it is an inaccuracy. If you remember in the movie, Steve stole this plane from the Germans, and in the place of the White Stars, it bore the famous German Iron Cross. This plane is actually a representation of the Fokker Eindecker, a single-wing plane that was unique in the age of biplanes. Lego being who they are and their history, I completely understand why they decided not to put the Iron Cross on this model. For more info on what I mean by that, check out Season 2 of a great series on Netflix called The Toys That Made Us. Fun fact, the Fokker Eindecker was the first aircraft that was outfitted with a synchronization gear that allowed the pilot to shoot a machine gun through the propellers without striking the blades. A few features to point out on this model. I love the use of the wheels from the wheelchair for the front landing wheels. It looks great, and if you look at a picture of a real Fokker Eindecker, it is a great representation of the spoked wheels that are used in real life. The rudder of the plane, while, well, chunky, does pivot back and forth. There's no flight stick for the pilot to hold on to, but it does have a very nice printed 1x2 plate with a couple of gauges on it. I always like when LEGO uses printed pieces versus stickers. All of the stars in this model are stickers, by the way. And the set, the set comes with a spare set of silver studs to use as ammo for the stud launchers. And though it's not part of the official build, there are studs behind the pilot's seat where you can attach them so you don't lose them. For the minifig, we start off with Steve Trevor. American soldier, pilot, spy, Diana's love interest. Steve is the one that crashed off the coast of Themyscira and brought Wonder Woman into the fight. Steve in minifig form is just as impressive as Chris Pine himself. His legs are a plain brown, and that fits the character well enough, but when you get to the torso printing for this one, I mean, have you ever seen a paint app so wonderful on a minifig? A khaki green flight jacket, blue shirt underneath, and then a ribbed sweater under that. Three layers of clothing with a printed buckled belt on the front. 
On the back, the printing continues with the waist belt that cinches the coat at the back and a fur collar. I really do love this figure, and we haven't even gotten to the head and accessories yet. For headgear, Steve wears a brown leather helmet with a pair of goggles. I believe we first saw this style of helmet and goggles with the Pod Racer set from the Dennis the Phantom Menace, but we shouldn't hold that against him. For a World War I look, this works out very well. In addition to his helmet, Steve comes with a hairpiece that is... is close. Is so close to being Chris Pine's hair from the movie. With one glaring issue. And I might be nitpicking here, but... His part is on the wrong side. So close, Lego. So close. His primary face is a smirk that works well for him. His secondary face is his battle face. Open mouth in the midst of some battle cry. It's very expressive and the open mouth gives it an additional something when he's in the pilot seat of the plane with the helmet on and the goggles down. Like he's in the process of a strafing run on Ares. It's not a look we really saw in the movie, but for a minifig, for a playset, it makes sense that they would have a secondary face like this for Steve. For accessories, he comes with a pair of revolvers. In the movie, he uses only one, but I like that LEGO included two with this set. Or, he is only supposed to have one, and I just got an extra one with mine. And finally, we have the star of the set, Princess Diana, Wonder Woman herself. And I like this version a lot. This is a repaint of the Wonder Woman minifig we received previously from the Heroes of Justice Sky High Battle set. In that set, her colors were much darker, matching the dark tone of Batman and Superman. Here we have a, vi a brighter version of her, which I'm surprised to find myself saying I prefer. Usually I go for dark coloring, especially with reds and blues, but for Wonder Woman, you want that bright, vibrant coloring. The paint application for her, just as with Steve, is wonderfully done. Across her torso, she has her armor as well as Baldric that is supposed to hold her shield and sword in place on her back. Instead of her tights or shorts, she has the leather skirt that was common to Roman armor during the reign of the Empire. I have no idea how to pronounce the name of what the skirt is called in the original Italian, so I'm just going to put it up on screen and you can look it up if you want to. And finally, she has her red boots topped with gold and black trim. The printing of the fig's torso continues on the back, and while it does not have as much detail as the front, that's perfectly fine. Most of the time her hairpiece is going to be covering her back anyway. This larger hairpiece is also the reason you can't put anything like a sword or shield holder on her back. Something else that differentiates this minifig from the previous Wonder Women is that her tiara was originally part of her hairpiece. It is now printed on the headpiece of the fig. Also, instead of being a tiara, the print gives it the look of the heavy circlet that she wears in the movie. On her wrists, we have printing for her bracelets of, sub of submission, which she can use to deflect bullets and create a magical shield. Fun fact, the bracelets actually restrict Diana's power. The idea being that she's too powerful for the mortal world, and her power unchecked would cause much collateral damage. So she wears them to protect others. But, when it's game on, she can take them off and get a substantial power boost. Did I mention she's a god? Or at least a demigod. I have one criticism of the paint application for this fig, and it breaks my heart to bring it up because everything else about this figure is so good. And I feel like this is something that could have been avoided. If you look across the top of her torso, on both the front and back, the flesh tone across the top is actually pink in color. Like they didn't apply enough flesh tone to paint over the red base. Everything else is just great about this Wonder Woman figure, that it's just a shame that this happens. Although this is something that is common to the Wonder Woman figure of old, so I guess we just have to accept that flesh coloring doesn't cover red very well. Diana's hairpiece is fantastic. Instead of the typical jet black, this fig's hair is a dark brown, matching the natural color of Gal Gadot. And just look at the sculpt of this piece. Thick and wavy, it is undoubtedly one of the best hair pieces we've had for Diana in a long time. In fact, I don't think her hair sculpt has changed at all until the minifigs for the DCEU came out. Diana has two faces. The primary one you've been looking at for a while now is just a smirk. 
a quirky and cute smirk. Some may argue that this is not very Wonder Woman, but it is very much Gal Gadot. All you have to do is watch the movie or any interview with her and you'll see her do this. Her secondary face is her battle face, and man do I like this. I know in the review for Tron Legacy I, comment, I commended Lego for giving Korra a serious face that wasn't an open mouth cry, but in this case I don't think you could go any other route. Just look at that print. The set of her eyes, her mouth opened in a battle roar, that is a dead ringer for the iconic shot from the movie where she's throwing the tank. While her accessories does not include her golden lasso that has come with nearly every other variation of this minifig, her magical sword and shield are included, which I am actually perfectly fine with. In the modern age of comics, as well as the modern age of Wonder Woman, her sword and shield are becoming just as iconic to her as the lasso itself. And besides, if you have any other Wonder Woman minifig, then you already have a golden lasso. Before we go on, let's take a look at this shield. I really appreciate the print that they have on this piece. It's so movie accurate, the paint deco is just fantastic. And finally, we were given this. A complete hood and cape set meant to represent the cloak she wore for a large part of the movie. I really appreciate LEGO adding this bit. It does a lot to add a little something to the minifig and make this one unique. I like that they decided to go with this darker blue instead of the black like in the movie. Black would have just been too drab for this set and not match the rest of the color scheme for either Diana or Steve. The blue looks much better. In addition, I believe that this is the first, possibly only time so far, that we have been given the hood piece in this color. So there's something for the collectors and custom builders. It wasn't for revenge, nor was she tasked with the protection of mankind by someone else. She doesn't do it for sport. She's not some rage monster who is compelled to fight. She's not a paid mercenary, and she certainly didn't resist the hero's call. If you leave, you may never return. What will I be if I stay? When Steve told her we can't save everyone, that wasn't good enough for her, and she stepped out into no man's land alone. Diana joined the fight for the most altruistic reason of all. She did what was right because it was right. By doing so, she filled a role in the DCEU that would normally be taken by Superman. Throughout the movie, we would come to realize that Steve himself had noble intentions to end the war. Not necessarily to win, just to end the war. And while some might argue it's a contrivance that they both stand on such moral high ground, my question to them would be, how could she have fallen in love with anyone who was less? If you're a fan of Wonder Woman, the DC Superheroes Collection, or LEGO comic book sets in general, then it's easy to understand why you should track this set down. Is she with you? I thought she was with you. It's still so stupid. Thank you again for taking time to listen to me talk LEGO. Please hit like and remember to subscribe. It's fast and easy and helps us out here immensely. Share it with your friends and spread the word that we're here. Check me out on Instagram, my username is Brickentire, and on IGTV you can find more videos of some of the smaller pieces of my collection. In case you haven't noticed, this is one of my favorite sets of my collection. I almost missed it when I started collecting again, this set had been discontinued. Luckily, I was able to find one at a reasonable price on the secondary market. That's all for today, I'll be back soon, and as always, thank you for watching. Hey, not for nothing, but William claims the likeness of Diana was based on his wife Elizabeth and their life partner, Olive Byrne. So, good on you, mate.